Previously on Inner Zenshin Radio. Give up on this model of peace meaning orderliness, but instead of peace meaning something more like a tabletop that can hold what's put on it. From there, you will naturally then start giving yourself the new problems called values. I mean, once you show up, the next thing is what's next, uh, because that's just the kind of monkey we are. And that's cool. That's cool. Because if the what's next isn't eliminative, you know, when I'm fixed, then I'll be able to live. But instead, as more creative, now that I'm here, what do I want to do? Welcome to Intersension Radio. And welcome. You have stumbled upon an extremely important interview. Hi, I'm Chris McCleary. Intersension Radio welcomes you. And we're here to provide you with ideas about how to develop a state of enduring inner peace. And inner peace requires good choices. Good choices implies that you are listening to your personal guidance system. This is an interview with producer Bill Bennett from Australia, who has developed a movie called Personal Guidance System. It's all about honing your ability to tune into intuition. And it sounds so simple. For some, it sounds eh, just mundane. But this is a very critical component for making wise choices in a chaotic world. Intersension Radio is now starting its live interviews. Now, not all interviews are live. Some are still recorded and edited down into a podcast. But some of them are going to be live at YouTube. And so go over to YouTube, look up Intersension, and click the subscribe button. And then there's a bell beside it so you get notified of any times that we're going live. So far, we don't have a consistent time of these live interviews but eventually we may but go ahead and head on over to youtube subscribe so that you don't miss any of the interviews we'll have some of the interviews over at youtube and these will be video as well as audio and then we'll also continue to have the podcast so uh, those will be available still on your favorite podcasting software all right here's the interview Welcome to all our Inner Zenshin radio listeners. I have a special guest here from Australia. Bill Bennett is an internationally renowned, award-winning Australian filmmaker, writer, producer. And he's garnered numerous awards over his 30-year career, including the Australian Film Critics Circle Awards for Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Writer, as well as the Australia's Emmy version. I think it's pronounced Logies. That's for right. television reporter of the year and most outstanding documentary. His films have been distributed through most of the major Hollywood studios, including Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, Universal, and the Samuel Goldwyn Company. He currently is an adjunct professor of screen studies at Queensland University of Technology, one of Australia's largest universities. So... What is Bill coming on the show for? Well, he experienced, he's going to tell more about this, but he experienced a very transformative near-death experience, which really shook him out of his very successful 30-year career and planted him on a global quest to better understand intuition from various standpoints, science, mysticism, philosophy, even physiology. That's just the beginning, folks. So first, let's welcome Bill to the show. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Chris. It's a real pleasure. So, you know, listening to your story actually sounds a lot like my transformative experience. And I've talked about it on the previous episodes. But these little, well, these big events happen to us for a reason, do they not? I believe they do. Yeah, for me it was a, a huge, um, a huge wake-up call. Uh, I certainly see it that way now. At the time, at the time, I found it very confusing. I didn't really know what the hell was happening, what it all meant. It's only now, some years later, that I'm able to look back on it and just see that 
it really was life changing. So intuition saved your life, basically. And it saved your life in a way to where you felt compelled to basically take a break. I don't want to speak for you, but take a break from this career of yours, a very successful and growing career, and just to travel the globe and explore the various facets of intuition. Do I have that basically correct? <laughs> well, um, you know, with any independent filmmaking career, it's always difficult to, um, you know, to categorize it as a success or otherwise. I guess Steven Soderbergh could. <laughs> <laughs> Or Spike Lee, you know, those guys. But um, I guess what happened was, uh, and I can explain it more in greater detail later on, but I heard a voice which saved my life. I, it was many, many years before I decided that perhaps I should make a film about it. And I tried over a period of almost 10 years to finance the film in ways that I had financed my previous films, and I was getting nowhere. Um, I was, uh, you know, people would acknowledge financiers and distributors and sales agents and, you know, each year I go to the Cannes Film Festival and sometimes Toronto and sometimes other festivals as well and places where you go to finance movies and people would say, yeah, well, look, this is really interesting and there could be a market for it, but there's never been a film made like this before and because of that we can't back you. Come to us when the film is all finished and then we'll sell it for you. And to which I would say, well, at that point, I'm not going to need you guys. <laughs> you know, that's not much help, <laughs> yeah. that's not much right. help for me at the moment. Um, and what I realized, Chris, at the time, no, sorry, it wasn't at the time. It was some time later. What I realized, one of the reasons why I couldn't get the film finance was because I was using old paradigms, if you like. Um, I was using my rational mind, my logical mind, my... Um, you know, past expertise to try and make a film about intuition and I discovered that in fact the only way to make a film on intuition truly and with any kind of level of authenticity is to make it intuitively and that's one of the reasons why it took so long to make the film because for me to make the film intuitively, that meant that I had to become intuitive and I had to embrace that world. And I wasn't prepared to do that initially. And then the name of the movie we're talking about is The Personal Guidance System, right? Yeah, the film is called PGS, Intuition is Your Personal Guidance System. And essentially what I propose in the film is that intuition acts like a personal GPS. It, it attempts to guide you through life. And its number one purpose is to keep you safe from harm and stop you from, you know, getting ill or, or dying before your life's purpose is realised. Um, but it, but it's, it, but it's also there to guide you through your life, to help you make choices and make the right choices, so that you can fulfil the purpose for which you were born. You know, and we've all experienced intuition. We've experienced it in different ways: a gut feeling, or sometimes in dreams. Um, you know, intuitive dreams, dreams which, which turn out to be prophetic, um, synchronicities, coincidences, these are all forms of intuition. We've all experienced them. And that's our intuition trying to guide us and trying to help us make the right choices. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And uh, I was really impressed with the cast of characters, the, and not really characters, but inter <laughs> interviewees in, the, in this movie from Carol and Miss to Dean Radin. Jeffrey Fan and um, gosh, Norman Sheely, that's just amazing. And intuition led you to all these people, as well as kind of the spiritual guides over in India as well. Well, look, exactly, Chris. What happened was um, when I decided to make the film, look, I'll go back one step. Um, if you've got the time, I'll tell you the story. I, I was at a point, I was at a point where I've been trying every different which way to get this film financed. I knew in my heart it would make a good film and there'd be an, an audience for it because I was interested in the subject and I figured other people would be as well. But I couldn't get any of these traditional backers to, you know, to, to finance me. I went to sleep one night um, saying to myself, after 10 years of struggling to get this film made, 
went to sleep one night saying to myself, all right, in the morning I've got to make a decision. I've got to decide either to make this film, maybe do something different, or, um, or just stop wasting my time and get on with my life and go back to doing what I normally do, which is make you know, thrillers and stuff like that. Anyway, I, um, I went to sleep, and that night I had a dream, and the dream was one of these extraordinary vivid dreams where I was told in no uncertain terms that I had to make the film, but I had to make it unconventionally. I had to jury-rig it, if you like, you know, just nickel and diamond. Um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't wait for the big crews that I wanted, the big budgets that I wanted, and, you know, what I'd done in previous movies. I should just go out and make it. And But the thing about the dream was this, that I, that I woke up out of that dream, you know, like just sort of <laughs> like a cliche in the movie, you know, sitting straight up in bed, eyes wide open, going boing, you know, like that. And big aha moment. Well, exactly. And I looked across at the bedside clock and it was 4.44 in the morning. Well, I wasn't really into numerology, but I knew enough to know that that was a bit weird particularly coming up out of this dream. So I had my iPad by my bedside and I Googled, what does 444 mean? Well, up came entry after entry after entry, essentially saying the same thing. But um, um, And what they said was this, was that 444 was a powerful angelic number telling me that right at that moment, my spirit guides, my masters and my angels and archangels were by my side encouraging me to move forward with my endeavor, uh, they knew that I'd been working on it up to this point, um, but that if I trusted my inner wisdom and my intuition, then they would protect me and guide me to great success. Right? Yes. So um, I'm reading this, you know, lying in bed, having just woken up out of, out of this very vivid dream, and I didn't believe in angels, right? At, at that point, <laughs> I do now, but I didn't then. And... I went, what the bloody hell do I do? Um, I knew that I had to make a decision. I knew in, 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 intuitively, I guess, <laughs> that I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision as to whether or not I believed this or whether I just put it down to some funny, crazy coincidence, you know, go back to sleep and then wake up and get on with my life. Well, right at that moment, at 4.44 in the morning, having just woken up out of that dream, I decided that I would believe it. It just seemed, you know, the double whammy of the dream and then waking up at 4.44 and finding out what that meant was just, for me, it was, n it was not a coincidence. There was something happening here. There was something greater at work. And I acknowledged that, even though I didn't really understand what it was and didn't really believe what it was, I guess, at that point, too. But I did go back to sleep. And then when I woke up the next morning, I decided to that I was just going to make the film I was just going to go and make it. I was just going to start straight away. So I, I tra uh, called up my travel agent, booked tickets to India because I knew intuitively that, that was a good place to start. I went out and I bought a camera and some sound gear and some lighting gear. I then went onto YouTube to figure out how to use them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> As well as I've been a film director, you know, I have other people right. do all that stuff. Right. You know, you got, you got whole camera departments and lighting departments and sound departments, you know, and you just say, right, I want the camera there. And, you know, but I had to figure out how to work the body camera and how to work all the sound gear and all that. So I did that. Um, and then I went to India and I didn't have any list of, of who I was going to interview. I didn't have any um, any idea. I didn't know who who all the top people in intuition were. I just lobbed into India and um, went to the Yoga Institute and got an interview with the director of the Yoga Institute to start off with. And she then led me to somewhere else to an ashram in Rishikesh and the ashram in Rishikesh led me to the Vatican and the Vatican then led me back to America and it just sort of happened like that. Now, I never had, right from the start, I never had a list of the who's who of intuition and sort of ticked them off one by one. I was led intuitively from person to person to person and when I look back on it now, I'm in absolute awe of the forces at work that work through me to lead me to these extraordinary people, to help me make the film that I ended up making. Did you ever have an experience where someone is recommending a person, but the intuition in you says, eh, I don't think so. I don't think that person is right. Well, that's a really good question. Um, 
Yes. On the one hand, my intuition led me to people. On the other hand, my intuition told me to stay away from some people. And I won't tell you who those people are because some of them are really right, quite, right. you know, big and powerful people. Um, but, um, you know, and, and at the time I, I would have, you know, would have made, if, I, if I'd been working with my rational brain, I would have said, my rational brain would have said, look, you're really going to have this person in the movie because they're a big name, they're a famous name, they're world-known, worldwide-known, and they would be great for your movie. But intuitively, it didn't seem the right fit, and so I stayed away from them. And I've got to say, well, let me, I won't tell you who it is, but I had the opportunity to get a big-name movie star into, into the film to talk about intuition, like a huge movie star, one of the top movie stars. Um, okay. to get into the movie. And I had a no on it, an intuitive no. Wow. And and I thought at the time, oh, that's strange because that person would be, you know, like a really big name to help promote the movie. And then cut to, you know, 12, 18 months later, that, that uh, movie star is involved in a huge scandal, <laughs> like a massive scandal that immediately debased their brand and would have been a liability in the film, you know, right. had I actually put them in the movie. So, you know, I think back on that, and I think, well, that's the reason why my intuition told me not to go with that person. So I'm interested in... So obviously intuition said, yes, come on, enters Engine Radio, right? Or else you wouldn't be here. Absolutely. That's good to know. Yeah. 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 Um, now, I've got so yeah. many experiences um, to ask you about, just to get your kind of t taste on this, but... I've, I've talked about this situation. I'll just make it really quick because other listeners have already heard it, but I was working on a Tesla coil and it needed a little chip and I had two different chips and one chip, I don't remember the name of it. The other one was 555 chip. And when you talked about the 444, um, I woke, I didn't, I couldn't decide. So I went to sleep and I woke up at 555 and I just couldn't believe it. It was just like, ding. Okay. I guess that's it. Hmm. But anyway, um, well, you know, sorry. it's interesting the way our intuition tries to connect with us. And what I've discovered is that intuition is both creative and persistent. If it can't get to you one way, it's going to get to you some other way. And it, it's very, very clever in the way that it chooses um, according to your particular predilections and preferences and likes and, and so forth. You know, so... If you are attuned to numerology, then your intuition will at times use numerology to connect with you. Um, if you're a visual person, then it will do so through television or YouTube or, you know, a signage on a bus going past or, you know, something like that. Um, I'm astonished at the way intuition tries to get its message through to you when it really wants to. But you know what? The other thing happens too. If you block it and you continually block it, then I've discovered that intuition goes, eh, okay. <laughs> you know, It gives up on you? It gives up on you. He's, a, he's, he's you not know, getting it. We'll he's not getting it. You know, this is a waste of time. You know, um, <laughs> we're here for you. We're, we're waiting for you. At some point in your life, when you're ready for us, we're here to help you again. But in the meantime... You go play your games with your rational mind. You, you figure it out yourself. Is is intuition work at a very mundane level? Like you could choose the flavor of ice cream that you'll like the most, or does it have to be really big and meaningful topic before intuition kicks in? No, intuition intuition is incredibly prosaic and everyday. And Carolyn Mace in the movie PGS Intuition is your personal guidance system. Carolyn Mace is one of the top intuitive um, medical intuitives in the world, if not the, the best. She says that intuition is ordinary. She says it's cellular, it's in your DNA, um, it is granular. And what I've discovered with intuition is this, is that it will connect with you on the little things. If for no other reason to say, hey, we're here, you know, we can help you choose which tie to wear today. Or it will, it will make it is there to help you make choices on the little, little things so that when the, when the bigger things come along, you have that body of experience. You know that it works on the little things. And so that when the big things come along, you're there capable and willing to trust it and go with it on the bigger decisions. 
You have to get out of your mind, correct? You've got to thought stop or, or slow down the mind in order to feel. Is it more of a feeling? Or it's a perception like looking at numbers or listening to coincidences or what Carl Jung calls synchronicities and seeing these kind of the same meme across different stimuli mm -hmm. or it can be a feeling a sensation exactly um number one you do have to get get out of your mind chris because your mind is um is your rational thought and your rational thought is always going to keep you small and constricted it is your ego self your personality self but it's not necessarily your true self your true self is your divine self and your intuitive self and that is the self that is trying to guide you. Your rational mind is trying to keep you in what's known. Um, I call it drawing from the archives. It's always trying to keep you within limitation. Your intuitive self wants to take you outside of limitation. It wants to take you to expansion and to discovery and true creativity. And getting back to what you said about feeling, I tell people I don't make decisions anymore. I feel them. You know, so so I can, my rational mind can say, yes, I really, really should do this. It makes a whole lot of sense that I should do this. But if it doesn't feel right, then I don't do it. And my feeling mind, my intuitive mind says, no, Bill, it's better you do this. And I've now learned through experience that when I follow that feeling mind, that feeling decision-making process, invariably everything works out. When I follow the rational mind and I have a level of discomfort with that, then you know, things go belly up. This, what you're describing is, reminds me of one of my master's degrees. We learned about human design and just basically like um, astrology on steroids, kind of a new astrology where it incorporates I Ching astrology, but it's a personality profile. So it's based on your birth date and time. And anyway, cut, cut to the chase. The instructions in human design for across everybody is to shut the mind down and we have these internal authorities inside the body, and it goes in priority order. So the highest would be the solar plexus, if it's defined, which I have. And, and then the spleen and the sacral, and these in order of importance of, um, of authorities. Some people don't have an authority, but that's rare. And uh, so anyway, they, these different organs or different chakras feel a little bit different. And so like the uh, solar plexus will, will be very chaotic because you'll feel all these different emotions, but you have to wait for the emotional clarity is what they call it. So it, it could take six months before you have an answer on whether or not I should get this car or that car or get rent this apartment or whatever. It might take forever. Um, but other times these sacral or the spleen might take a split second. In fact, it needs to take a split second because if you miss it, that you've lost your chance of intuition. <laughs> so I find that fascinating that what you're talking about sounds exactly like human design. It does. And um, one of the things that I discovered when I, when I began this process was that um, I found intuition to be a very con confusing subject when I first started out. Uh, it seemed that it was a word that was bandied around and covered a whole bunch of different things, uh, none of which really um, made sense to what happened to me in the car when I heard a voice. And well, for a start, it seemed to me that people used the word intuition and instinct interchangeably. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. I've come to, come to understand is that instinct is vastly different from intuition. But it only helped confuse me more. And so what I did is over literally a period of quite a few years, I came up with my own definition of what intuition is based on what happened to me in that car. And that definition is intuition is a sudden unexplained insight that comes unaided by logic, intellect or expertise. Now, each word is, is key. Intuition is a sudden the word sudden is important because you, you talked about it being sudden before. Sudden, unexplained. We don't know where intuition comes from. Insight. It's insightful intuition that comes unaided. We, we don't prompt it or um, ask for it. Unaided. 
by logic, intellect, or expertise. You know, these are three aspects of the rational thinking process. So that, to me, explained a voice that comes out of nowhere suddenly telling me to slow down so that my life can be saved. Was that an audible voice? Or like an internal to the mind voice? Well, I'm wearing headphones at the moment and it's a voice like I'm hearing you at the moment. So it kind of seems like it's inside me but outside me as well, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have wisdom in our bodies. We have wisdom in every cell of our bodies, as Carolyn May says. You know, it is organic, uh, intuitive, divine um, energy is organic within our body. And, uh, you know, so you're choosing the right option time and time again is part of the wisdom of your body expressing itself in that way. How do you parse out between like just a what feels like an intuition, but really it's just a, an emotion based on what you're thinking about your rational mind, sort of result of your rational mind, but it feels like intuition. So, you know, um, how do you parse out those two things? You know, you have maybe a sick feeling over a option A, but how do you know it's not just a sick feeling based on the possible futures? You know, if right, am I making any sense? Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of the it's one of the um, it's one of the common questions I get asked when I do Q and A's at my screenings and so forth, and um, and it's also been something of real interest to me. And what I came to understand, based on all the people that I spoke to in my movie, was that the real way to tell to differentiate between what is a rational thought, a rational need, an intuitive thought, or an intuitive um, hit, if you like, is that fear is never associated with intuition. Um, intu intuition stands outside of fear. Um, if there is fear associated with your thought or with your decision, then it is part of what Paul Selig, who features in my movie, calls the small self. Um, it is part of your ego-based personality self, your rational self. It's not your true self. Your true self um, is is your true self has has absolutely no no linkage with fear at all. Um, it is it's clear just a knowing. It's a peaceful it's a, it's, knowing. It's an absolute sense of knowing. And the other thing too is that um, what people have told me um, is that there's always a sense of doubt um, with your mm -hmm. rational mm -hmm. thought, whereas with your intuitive sense. There is that sense of knowing. There's absolutely no doubt at all. And Paul Selig says the small self thinks the true self knows. And your true self is your intuitive self. So your true self knows. Your small self thinks. And then we also have, I, I think I remember in the movie, was like a purity of the intent or mm -hmm. the purity of the request allows yeah. the answer to become clear. Yeah, Judith Orloff, Dr. Judith Orloff in, in the film talks about that, about the purity of the, the request. I mean, you know, we can, and also Paul Selig mentions this as well, you know, that we can ask for wealth and abundance and a Ferrari and, you know, and, um, you know, a, a beautiful spouse or, you know, something like that. But source if you like, a creative source, which is the, the fountain from which all intuition springs, is going to make decisions based on what is in your best good or your highest good. Um, now, abundance may not necessarily be in your best good. It might, in fact, be lack of abundance that, that is in your best good. And, I mean, Chris, you must have experienced this, you know, through your life as well. When people come to you and they say, look, I, I've lost my partner, I've lost all my money, uh, this huge calamity has happened to me, and in fact it's been the best thing that's, that ever could have happened because... That happened to me. <laughs> it, it has? Yeah, absolutely. I spent a yeah. few years out on the mountain without any income and, and healed from my military career. Mm. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Well, Other than meeting my soulmate afterwards. 
<laughs> well, I mean, you, you, you know, you're living proof of that. And there are, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this who have had a similar kind of experience where, you know, they've, um, they've faced a major health issue um, or they've faced a major financial crisis or, you know, or some sort of personal, um, what they thought was at the time was an absolute total disaster not realizing in fact that because of that it's led them to this and this and this and this to the place where they are right now you know which is a place that they never would have got to had that calamity not happened you know so we think that intuition is always going to lead us to joy and happiness and, and fulfillment um, yes but it's not necessarily going to be a direct path <laughs> right yeah i i get what you're saying it's um so the ego comes in and doesn't want to hurt. And so it's resisting what the soul knows as the way forward, even though it might be hard work or very poor conditions or whatever. I, um, you know, I... Well, so, oh, sorry, Chris, just on that. I, yeah. look, I, 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 would, I would not agree with you that the ego doesn't want to hurt. Um, what the ego wants to do is protect itself. You know, mm. that, that's, that's what it wants to do. It, it wants... It wants it. It feels comfortable in stasis, um, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas intuition wants you to change, um, wants to grow and evolve. Yeah, exactly. But but um, but ego basically has got this fortress, and it's got these big thick walls, and it wants you to stay within those walls because that's protection. And intuition wants to, yeah, intuition wants to lead, lead you outside of those walls and see this huge world outside those walls. But, but your ego wants to keep you protected. Now, sometimes that's not going to be for your ultimate benefit. Right, yeah, obviously. People, people, look, people love rational thought because it's safe. Um, intuition is not safe. That's what scares the pants of a lot of people about intuition. And that's, and that's why they don't trust it. Because it's not safe. It's going to lead you into the unknown. And a lot of us are terrified of the unknown. We don't want to go there. But intuition wants to take us there because intuition knows that, that within that unknown lies true discovery. And in that discovery comes growth and fulfillment. I... Um... I mean, I have, I've experienced exactly this, but it was very painful to go through, you know, um, basically I questioned the career I was in, uh, working for some very high level generals and I made some very big questions and, uh, it, it didn't go over well, but I remember those times where it felt like I, I couldn't not say anything and I, and I said it, and the result was just very traumatic. Everything changed from that. It was, you can't, you can't go back on, on those questions. And that's how I ended up where I did. But it was very transformative. It ultimately set me on my life path. It took me a lot longer than you know your your transformation of of the car incident, but um it was a multiple year thing and uh, probably about 7 years from start to finish and oh, here i well, am chris my, mine was 20 years right oh okay I mean, that that whole thing with the car happened in 1999 okay so <laughs> this this year in fact brings it up to 20 years so so like wow. like you it didn't happen fast it actually happened over quite a long period of time yeah but it needed a a huge catalyst and exactly. it all comes back to intuition mm. so how do we connect Intuition, personal guidance system with inner peace? Well, really good question. Um, number one, we all have intuition. We're born with it. It is, I believe, a legitimate system, as legitimate as any other system in our body, like our immune system, our circulatory system, our central nervous system. It's, it, it, is, it is a legitimate functioning system that we're born with, it's just that it works energetically. And because it works energetically, the rationalists and the scientists and the people who love to live by empirical laws have a real problem with it. Now, how do we tap into and use that intuition so that we can have it benefit our lives? Well, 
in the film I, I detail a five-step plan. Stop, listen, ask, trust, follow. Stop, listen, ask, trust, follow. Um, your intuition, as I said before, is creative, persistent. It's there for us. We've just got to be in a state where we can um, listen to it, recognize it, be willing to work with it, um, be humble enough to allow it to do its job. You know, there are a number of things, really, that, that you need to do. But one of the things that I discovered when I was making the film, when I asked people, how do you tap into your intuition, um, pretty much the common answer I got back was, get your life together. You know, if you're consumed by anger or fear or greed or envy or, you know, any of these base emotions, intuition's going to have a real hard time getting a foothold. You know, so you've got to clean up your act and get rid of all that stuff. And as Carolyn May says, humble up. I love that term, humble yeah. up. Um, yeah. And only then can intuition then start to connect with you. So you, you have to be, you have to already have a state of inner peace of some sort before intuition can even be realized? Would that be a... Um, look, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I sort of am out of step with a lot of people in this space who believe that you have to meditate to be intuitive. I think that's nonsense. You know, a lot of people, I mean, most of us are intuitive. All of us are intuitive, right. you know, because we all have it. Um, you know, some of us have uh, a greater sensitivity to it or have opened up a bigger door to it um, without resorting to meditation. But the first thing you've got to do, rather than have inner peace, you've got to stop. You know, you've got to find time each day just to stop, even for five minutes, and just listen to yourself. And listen to, you know, just start to be aware of your thoughts and your feelings and be aware of things that are outside you as well. Um, one of the things that came through pretty much in every single interview I did, and I ended up doing 76 interviews for the film, of which only 26 ended up making the final cut. But of all those people that I interviewed, one common thread that came through was pay attention so to, to start to become more intuitive, you've got to start to pay attention both to your feelings and your thoughts and the workings of your interior self, but also of things around you because intuition will present in the most unobvious ways. For instance, you know, you've got a bit of a dilemma, you've got a problem you need sorting out. You go to a cafe and you're sitting at a cafe and you're having a coffee or whatever. Um, and then you cock an ear to a conversation of two people at a nearby table. And they're talking about exactly the kind of thing that you're having your problem about. And in overhearing that conversation, suddenly the solution comes to you. Oh, I need to do this. And that didn't happen by chance. You know, that wasn't a coincidence. That happened. That's part of your intuitive system working. But you wouldn't have been aware of it if you hadn't paid attention. So this notion of actually paying attention to the things around you, like I say, both exterior and interior, is a terribly important part of figuring out the intuitive puzzle. And it's not like a, a struggle. You're not like pulling the answer in like in a convergent mind. It's more of a divergent, which right, uh, uh, is more relaxed and allowing and just looking and observing rather than trying to pull. Give me the answer. Yeah. Give me. Right? <laughs> well, exactly, because Norm Shearley uh, in the film, as you probably uh, saw, as he said, every time you demand an answer, you're not going to get it. Mm. Uh, you know, and, and coming back to that definition, intuition is a sudden unexplained insight that comes unaided. This thing unaided is important. You know, you're not you're not demanding. You're not asking. Um, it's um, it's there for you. It's waiting for you to accept it as you develop or find kind of the sweet spot in your intuition do you find that it's a lot easier to find from then on i mean can you is this it just takes practice is it kind of like a skill rather than a 
a thing that we all do? It's a muscle. Um, it is a muscle. And like any muscle, uh, it gains strength the more you use it. Um, you know, we're all born with this muscle, but some of us, uh, because we don't trust it, we don't ever use it, it becomes atrophied. You know, and then when we do need to use it in a case of life or death situation, because we've not used it in the past, it and and because it's weak and we don't trust it, um, it's not there for us when we really do need it. And, and so, and we don't trust it either. Well, exactly. Even yeah. if even if we had it, we wouldn't trust it. Doesn't yeah. matter if it's there or not. You wouldn't you wouldn't go with it anyway. Yeah, and a lot of people don't even acknowledge that intuition exists. You know, so how can they hope to access it and use it when they really need to if they don't acknowledge that it exists? So, um, so yeah, you, you know, it is a. It's like going. I, I say it's like going to the intuitive gym each day. Um, you know, you you play little games with yourself to, you know, going back to what we said before about doing small things, small intuitive things. Um, going against what the weather forecast says and taking an umbrella when, you know, when the forecast says it's going to be sunny. And then you find out that it pours down with rain and your intuition was right. Um, I use my intuition when I go and try and find a parking space. People talk about the parking angel. And I absolutely <laughs> believe the parking angel is real because I've used it. And it's a little game I play. And what it does is it, it is going to the intuitive gym each day and developing and strengthening your intuitive muscle so that when there is a occasion when you need to use your intuition and like I said it could be a life or death thing um, you, you've developed that muscle you trust that muscle and you can use it I love that concept so the overall thing you know you have like each each uh, intuition incident is stop, listen, ask, trust. But over the grand scheme or the practicing in this muscle gym that you talked about, it's um, what learning how to, where to observe, how to observe, testing yourself on the small things. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, well, my building wife. Trust, building trust. Yeah. Building ahead. trust. Yeah. My wife um, plays this little intuitive game where we go to a restaurant or a cafe or something and, and she picks up the um, menu and she makes her choices absolutely intuitively. You know, it's kind of a yes-no thing, um, you know, and, and she, she ends up sometimes with the weirdest <laughs> food <laughs> on her plate. Um you know, and she goes, oh, crikey, my, my intuition says that I've got to have fruit bat tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it, it, it's, just, um, it's just a way for her to bring intuition into her life in a very kind of everyday, regular, prosaic kind of way so that it's not special. It's, you know, it's not sort of saved for those, you know, special big decisions. It is a part of her everyday thinking, her everyday operating through life. So that um, once again, when the big decisions come along, you know, should I, should I go into this business relationship? Um, you know, should I, you know, sh should we move house? Things like that. Um, her intuition is a solid functioning system that she can use. Mm -hmm. That's what I was lacking. I, uh, with this experience that I talked about earlier, is what I was lacking is the trust in this dousing mechanism. But it turned out it it passed the blind study. So how do you not trust that? And I, the other thing I wanted to mention is, like, just because it, it's so clear that answer B was the answer based on the dousing and that it, that channel of intuition, doesn't mean that my ego is going to get the outcome at once but the soul journey is correct by going that route and mm. it and it might be a like a kind of a painful experience for ego or the or the physical body <laughs> yeah, it we... was not a pretty you know seven years for me it was it was hard but 
I will never change that. I, I would do it again. Mm. Well, Chris, I mean, you know, you are a unique person in the sense that you did trust your intuition. You did run with it. A lot of people don't. And I, I do believe that one of the reasons why there is um, so much ill health in the world, there's so much um, uh, depression and related things like alcoholism and drug addiction and and general unhappiness is because the, is because people have lost their way. They have fallen off their path. Um, and I do believe that that we are born with a purpose, we are born with a path. Our intuition's purpose is to keep us on purpose, keep us on our path. You know, but because of the fears that we, you know, that we bring to ourselves, the fears that we believe will protect us, um, we shift off that path. And so then we turn around five, ten years later and we're in a relationship that's desperately unfulfilling. Uh, we're in a job that we hate. Um, you know, we are in financial peril because we've spent money on things trying to make us happy, which invariably they don't. And all of that stems stems back to the fact that we've lost our way. And our intuition is a guidance system that is designed, divinely designed, I believe, to keep us on our path and and to give us true guidance. I, I, I love these words. And so we know we need to practice it. It's a muscle. We know we need to um, test it out and, and use it more often. I want to go so far as to say that my typical question for my interviewees is towards the end is, what is the biggest block to inner peace? And you just outlined that answer, which is to not follow this personal guidance system. It's there. It's like a form of disconnection of yourself to not follow it, to not be practicing with it. And, you know, this is just for, for me as well. Is I know it's there. I've lived it. And, uh, and still I bypass it. So I need to, I need to practice this more. Would you agree that's probably the, one of the biggest blocks to inner peace is taking the wrong route because it's the rational route, ignoring intuition? Well, the bigger question is why do we do that? You know, why why do we take the other route? Why do we why do we always um, stick with the rational? And that's because it's safe. And the reason that we like to be safe is because we're scared. Um, so it all stems back to fear. Fear is the biggest block to intuition. Uh, it is the biggest cause of unhappiness. I know that there is a school of thought that says that fear is essential, that it protects us, that it's you know, it's a mechanism that keeps the species alive and so forth. I think that's absolute nonsense. Um, I think that, well, as Paul Selig says, um, the purpose of fear is to create more fear. You know, and when you look ar when you look around when you look around at the world around you, you can see how fear has permeated almost every single aspect of modern living. Absolutely. I don't know what it's like in your country, but, but you know, in Sydney, for instance, you look at the cars on the road. Now, the majority of them are big SUVs and four-wheel drives. Mm -hmm. Now, why do people buy these stupid cars? They cost more to run. You know, they're more dangerous to, to operate on the road because they're less nimble and, and so forth. But people buy them because they feel it's not like they're you know, out every second day out in the, out in the outback or, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, climbing up the side of mountains and stuff like that. I mean, normally they drive to the shops, they drive their kids to school, and they drive home, you know, and they, they're driving these huge bloody four-wheel drives. And the reason they do it is because of fear, because they believe that having that much metal around them is going to give them protection. And they're higher up, they can see danger coming more clearly, all of these sort of things. You know, they're like in this fortress castle, you know, looking out over the lowlands, you know, seeing where the enemy is going to come from. It's an absolute nonsense. It's based on fear. And if you look at that example, and then you look at other ways that fear permeates every single, pretty much, you know, so many decisions that we make, bigger decisions and smaller decisions. I mean, if we could live without fear, you know, then suddenly racial discrimination, racial discord would fall away, bigotry would fall away, 
um, I believe that major health issues like obesity would, would, you know, would fall away because a lot of people eat because they're unhappy and they're unhappy because they're scared. You know, it all comes back to fear. You know, so, so fear, I think, is the, is the biggest boogeyman in all of this. Well, Bill, do you have any new um, trainings that people should know about or some new projects that are coming out, maybe new movies? And how do they find this PGS? Let's make sure we get that out, any websites that you have. Well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, look, um, people can go to the film. Um, people can find the film on the film's website. It's not on, it's not on Netflix or iTunes or anything like that. We're just selling it off the website at the moment. PGSthemovie.com. It's really simple, pgsthemovie.com. There is a book associated with the film as well. In fact, it's, it's an expansion on the film. I explore other ideas in the book, and that's on Amazon. Again, it's, oh, called, P, it's called PGS Intuition. It's your personal guidance system. Um, later in the year, we're going to be putting out some um, video modules which are going to uh, teach people what intuition is, how it presents, how it works, and how they can tap into it to make better choices. So that's going to uh, that's going to come out if they go onto the website and sign up to the newsletter. Then they'll get information on that. Um, as for my next project, interestingly enough, I'm looking at making a film on fear. Oh, perfect! We've gone full circle on this <laughs> we have. episode. But, yeah, yeah, because I do believe that fear is. Um, is one of the biggest um, inhibitors to personal growth at the moment. Yeah. If we can, if we can step outside of fear, wouldn't that be amazing? You know, how how would our lives change? Um, if we can step outside as individuals, if we can step outside as societies, as a civilization, you know, talk about a step towards transformation. That would be huge. And fear does come in different forms, like anxiety. You know, you, know, you have. I, I'm a, also a substance abuse counselor, so even um, marijuana can, you know, it's like a miracle drug for a lot of people. But too much of it can cause natural anxiety or non-natural anxiety, just constant anxiety, unless you've got your weed. And so we do make these choices that put us into the fear basket. You know, anxiety being a form of fear. Yeah. I mean, look, the whole insurance industry is based on fear. Mm -hmm. It's based on fear. Yeah. Preparation. Yeah. yeah. It's, Are yeah. we allowed to pre prepare? Are we allowed to prepare without fear? We just prepare just for being smart? Like <laughs> have, stashing away some water in case the electricity goes out? Well, <laughs> well kind of look, fear. <laughs> if um, it's absolute fear, but look, if you accept the notion that you are guided through life, then what is there to fear? Because your guidance will only take you in the right places. So hoarding is a definite form of fear. Hoarding is definitely fear. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, fear I have lost. I'm, I'm fear of loss, fear of lack. I think there is, uh, if you're being guided to stash away some water, that could be a form of intuition. So you really check on what's your motivation, right? I think that's the differentiator. If you're always in fear, you're you're going to be getting way too much water or too many plastic bags or whatever. But if you're being guided and tapped into your intuition, that's yeah. a different story. That is a different story, yeah. I mean, it's not like I've got, you know, three rooms full of plastic bags. I think I've got this <laughs> You know, if I did that, I think I'd, I'd come to you, Chris, and seek counseling. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else you'd like to, to tell the listeners? Bill, it's really been a pleasure talking with you. I'm so glad that we got to, a chance to talk. Oh, look, I'm, I'm so pleased too, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I, I'll leave this 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 idea for people to think about. First thought, best thought. Your first thought is your intuitive thought. And it's your best thought. And what happens is normally when our first thought kicks in, and it's normally very fleeting, we dismiss it because it's too left field. And we go, no, I cannot go there. That's just too crazy. And then what happens is our second thought lobs in, and our second thought is 
is, has gone through the filtering process, and it's based on common sense or best practice or, you know, what's what you know has worked in the past. And so we tend to gravitate towards a second thought. So many of us don't give um, full respect to the first thought, which is the intuitive thought. So going back bef to before about what you talked about, you know, what things can you do in daily life to develop your intuitive muscle? If you start to operate on first thought, best thought, that will start to develop your intuition probably better than anything. Gosh, I mean, it's just chock full. How, how many different kinds of things can you talk about when we're talking about one word, intuition? Um, I still have, a, I have still some more questions. Maybe have to bring you back on, Bill. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm around. We'll get the time zones right. <laughs> yeah. All right, Bill. Thanks so much for being on the show and uh, look forward to discussing more of your work terrific uh, chat with you thank you until next time welcome to interzention radio